one of the biggest prizes in the class of 2023, Mackenzie and Baca will commit on Friday evening to either Kansas or Indiana. Which blue blood has more at stake with his commitment? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, welcome in to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and joining me today is our guy, Kyle Boone, college basketball writer at CBS Sports. Brother, so great to have you on the show today. Coming up, the transfer portal closed yesterday, so we're going to talk about late additions, their plans, and uh, who didn't enter the transfer portal and anyone we see there. And by the way, Rick Pitino is busy and staying at it. But before we get to all that, we do need to talk about Mackenzie Mbaco. He is a consensus top 10 pick at all the recruiting sites, except like I think on three has him outside, whatever, who cares? But basically this, yeah, exactly. That's the face, Kyle Boone. Asked out of his national letter of intent from Duke after just so happened that Kyle Filipowski returned, and later that day we learned this news. So that's where it's at. I don't think those are coincidental in any way, shake, or form. But uh, as we record this, Kyle Boone, we do not know yet where McKenzie Mbako is going to land. So here is my question to you, sir. For which school is McKenzie Mbako's decision more important? I mean, first of all, thanks for having me back. And second of all, incredible professionalism by you. McKenzie Mbako, like just rolling it off the tongue, no big deal. Like I'm prepared to go as far as like McKenzie M or <laughs> just straight McKenzie, just first name basis. So <laughs> shout out to you. Uh, the listeners have to know that that was uh, very well rehearsed. Thank um, you. I'm just trying to keep up with GP and his Jonathan Chamwa Chachua. Chamwa Chachua. Chamwa Chachua. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know what? I, th- I think it's probably bigger for Kansas. Um, Ooh. it's big for who it's big for whoever Absolutely. would potentially land him. Obviously like Indiana's losing trace Jackson Davis. And I think he would slot in assuming he went to the Hoosiers. I think he would slot in obviously as, as a day one starter. But to me, I think it's, it's bigger for Kansas because Kansas is losing a ton of production. Um, they're losing, Ernest Uday Jr., who's a former McDonald's All-American, who earlier this week entered the transfer portal. And to me, to me, Isaac, I'm all about reading the tea leaves. To me, that suggested, hey, maybe Mr. McKenzie M is looking Kansas's way, thinking, hey, let's let's see if we got some space over there. And then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. Uday hops into the transfer portal. So maybe it means nothing. Maybe it means something, but Kansas is on a roll right now. They just landed Hunter Dickinson, who was a three-time All-Big Ten player from from Michigan. Uh, they've added uh, Arterio Morris, who was a former McDonald's All-American, was, was at Texas last year and didn't, didn't make a huge impact. They've got a really good incoming recruiting class. Uh, Marco Jackson is, is a five-star that is enrolling. So, I mean, you had McKenzie M to that mix, then suddenly you're talking about, I think one of the most impressive new transfer slash high school classes coming into next year. So um, we'll see. I I, I think it, Kansas has already solidified itself as probably a preseason top five team, but I think there's a pretty bulletproof case to be made with McKenzie Mako that, (laughs) uh, that this is, this is a potentially a preseason number one team. So I think it'd be huge. Yeah, that I mean, I have even started reckoning with it after the Dickinson commitment that they they're at least in that conversation for number one preseason or, or, you know, I don't know, front runner, but at least top three national championship favorites. And then this so this could put them over the top if they're not already there um, for Kansas. And it's interesting because, you know, you've got um, Adams coming back. We we don't know if. yet about Kevin McCuller coming back or not. So that, that's a possibility as well. Um, I, I would think not if Mbako comes. And I'm right with you. I'm reading those tea leaves on Ernest Uday, and I'm like, yeah, that, that tells me everything I need to know right there. As, as soon as that happened, I was like, sorry, Mike. Sorry, Mike Woodson. Uh, that, that'll be okay. But speaking of that, um, Kyle, on the Indiana side of it, 
they, as you said, they've already lost Trace Jackson Davis. They lose Race Thompson and Miller Cop and Jalen Hood Shafino, all these guys out. And so in some regard to me, it feels like for Kansas, Mbako is a piece of the puzzle. But for right. Indiana, it's almost like kind of he is the puzzle in some ways, you know. Mm. And to that regard, I feel like there, there's certainly an argument I can make for him being – like there's more at stake for Indiana with landing Mbako versus Kansas, where it's like Kansas is already going to be really good. It's just like this is next level for Indiana. It's like, can we contend in the Big Ten or not? At some degree, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Yeah. No, I get that. I definitely get that. And and I think to your point, Indiana probably if you're doing like a who needs it more meter, Indiana definitely ranks higher on the who needs <laughs> Mbako more meter than Kansas does. I mean, Indiana has a chance to be pretty good next season, Isaac. Like, this is a pretty decent incoming recruiting class. I really like Gabe Cups and, and Ja'Kai Newton, two guards who have already signed with this program. And they have some interesting transfers, including former five-star recruit who was at Oregon last season, a guy who entered the entered last season as a, a guy who I thought was going to be a potential one-and-done lottery pick. And um, he's, he's seven foot tall. He's, like, you know, 220 pounds, something like that. So – um, they, they have a ton of talent in that building, um, and, and I think their front court, for the most part, is kind of set. Mbaka would kind of be a luxury, um, but the talent level and I think the talent upgrade that he would provide to Indiana is um, is pretty pretty significant. Like they, they took some really good swings in the portal, and I think it'll end up working out. Indiana would be a factor, I think, in the Big Ten, but – you add Mbako to that mix, I feel like he's more of a sure thing, more of a guy who I think will will be an immediate contributor, whereas some of these other guys, they'll probably work out, but they are, I think we have to acknowledge, like there's a reason that they are probably leaving their past situations. <laughs> they're looking for a way to recoup some value or if they're trying to improve their draft stock or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, Mbako would be huge for Indian. I just, I think it's, probably Kansas in the mix as, as the favorite, at least entering his decision. Yeah, and hopefully for Indiana, getting Xavier Johnson back fully healthy next year will be massive as well. Uh, yeah. Is that your call, Kyle Boone? At the end of the day, when we go to bed tonight, uh, is McKenzie and Baco a Kansas Jayhawk? He is. He is. And um, cannot wait to just put this on uh, freezing cold takes. Like, this is <laughs> – this is just like exactly what you're not supposed to do as a media member. Make your shot and then record it and then release the audio after the decision. That being said, congrats to KU. Mbako to KU. This is fantastic. I, I really do think it's a really good fit for Kansas. I think it's a good fit for Mbako. Good situation. Like this isn't this is gonna be a really good Kansas team. And he fits, I think, a, a really important piece of that puzzle for Kansas next season. And, and to me, you already had Hunter Dickinson. You add Mbako to that mix, and you have a really, really solid front court. You already have, you know, guys that I think you trust in, in your back court, depending on if McCuller comes back or not. But Dewan Harris should be back. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting roster in Kansas. You know, for the 38 consecutive season, will probably be Big 12 preseason favorites, and uh, deservedly so either way. Man, Bill Self just keeps on rolling. He is inevitable, yeah. I think we can say at this point. Well, Ernest Uday is not the only notable transfer portal entry in the final days of the transfer portal. We have several more. We want to look into that, and we'll do all of it in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Built. Are you looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all the sugar and calories? Then you need to try the best tasting protein bar out there, Built. If you're like me and you're trying to make some healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on taste, then listen, you got to check out these Built Bars or Puffs, which are healthy and yet taste amazing. What makes them so good? Well, first off, they're covered in 100% real dark chocolate, and they come in amazing flavors like churro or peanut butter brownie. Not to mention, I don't, I don't know how they do this, but they maintain these amazing macros, just 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, and yet... 17 grams of protein. Beyond all this, now you don't have to wait for an order to come from Built.com. You can rush right on down to Walmart or Sam's Club and get yourself a nice little small box from Walmart or the Big Daddy from Sam's Club. So go check it out. Built, a proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. 
Folks, thanks so much for joining with us on Locked On College Basketball today. Don't forget, coming up next week, Andy Patton and I will be talking about transfer portal winners and losers with the portal closing. We'll be unpacking what McKenzie Mbaco actually does decide to do and much more coming up. Kyle Boone, in fact, is going to be at the NBA Combine coming up next week in Chicago. And so, of course, we will have him on to give us all the inside scoop from that afterwards. As we get into talking about some of these late minute additions into the transfer portal, I do want to remind everyone of a couple things. Just because the portal is closed doesn't mean that we have that we've heard every name. There's still paperwork often processing, so there might be more names that leak out. Also, keep in mind that anyone who is an undergrad that's graduating and looking to be a grad transfer, they aren't restricted by the transfer portal deadline. Now, if it's a postgraduate already looking to go somewhere else, that day has already come and gone. That was May 1st. So just keep all of these kind of things in mind, as well as this is not the deadline for people to commit to their schools. They can, if you're in the portal, you're good, and then you can commit at any point. So a couple names that we had, Kyle, in, in the last couple days of the portal, as of people we know right now. Obviously, we've already said Ernest Uday transferring away from Kansas. As we've said, that's very telling of McKenzie and Baco's decision. We had Mac Etienne leaving UCLA. DeMarco Dunn transferring out of North Carolina, which I think is also telling about somebody that's headed there. Jalen Moore from Georgia Tech. And then a couple reported by Jeff Borz. Hines from Maryland, Rondell Walker from TCU, who was previously in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And then on Wednesday, there's a couple guys that I want to land on and talk about. Malcolm Dandridge from Memphis, another big from UCLA, Abramo Kanka, excuse me. But then two who I really want to hone in on, Kyle, is Julian Phillips from Tennessee and Arthur Kaluma from Creighton. And here's why. Both of these guys are also in the NBA draft. Also, you will be seeing them in Chicago this week at the Combine, and yet they make a last-minute decision to hop into the transfer portal. We can take these one at a time or at the big-picture level. Why would they make this last-minute decision to join the transfer portal? Oh, it's all about keeping those options open, baby. you got to go to the highest bidder. This is, uh, this is the college basketball world kind of in a nutshell. At this point, um, they've already entered the, the NBA draft. They're getting feedback and will get feedback over the next couple of weeks from NBA front offices and scouts and, and decision makers about where their stock is, where they stand. And um, that that feels like pretty much standard fare in, um, in college basketball right now and, and, and players who have aspirations to play in the NBA. Even if you're like a fringe NBA player, that is like, of course, you want to go through the process. You want to get feedback. You want to try and become a better basketball player. Like, that is a very simple process to go through. You don't have to pay any, you know, <laughs> penalty for, for doing so. So, um, Phillip's a guy who was, you know, really highly touted recruit coming into into college. Um, potential first rounder. Like, I actually think he's probably in the mix to be a potential first rounder. And then Kaluma was was – pretty good last season I, I don't think he made quite the same leap that people expected that he would but big wing can defend he has some shooting potential like this is a guy who I think is a potential developmental prospect who you know like if um if NBA teams like what they see and see the context of, of that Creighton team last season they may be really high, really high on him so um the, the going to the NBA draft process and entering the transfer portal makes a lot of sense because uh, now you've got your options open. You can, um, if you just get a crazy offer, right? Like you're just like, okay, well Miami paid me $700 million. Like, all right, I'll, uh, sure. I'll turn down the NBA draft. I'll, I'll put my professional prospects on hold to go play um, in Miami. So like, it's all about keeping your options open. I'm curious to see kind of how, how the feedback goes with both of those guys specifically. Um, just because I do think they are like fringe first round picks, but man, if they stay in the portal and, and pull out of the NBA draft, like we're talking about, you know, two guys who could be like potential all Americans next season. I really believe the impact that they could have on whatever school they go to would be pretty, pretty significant. 
Yeah, I mean, you think about the Tennessee angle of it, who's also losing Olivier Kamwa yeah. to the transfer portal. I mean, that's that's a could be a double doozy of a tough blow to lose both those guys yeah. for Rick Barnes. Kyla, as you look at it today, if you were having to choose between one of those two, Julian Phillips or Arthur Kaluma, to stay in the draft, which one do you think would be more likely right now to do so? Mm. You know, I think just in terms of – in terms of – um, you know, like pedigree and high school recruiting rankings, Phillips would make the most sense to me. I mean, this is a guy who's like, you know, a, a consensus five star recruit. He's, you know, six foot eight, six foot nine, big wing, like fits pretty much exactly what the NBA is looking for. Um, so to me, like, he's he's still really young. I'd have to go look, but you know, he's he was only a freshman last season, so he's he's still probably a teenager. And um, the NBA likes guys like that who they, you know, they feel they can mold, who have like, you know, prototypical, prototypical size and, and good frame. So that would make the most sense to me that, that Phillips is most likely to stay. That being said, like Kaluma would make a lot of sense too. And this is a guy who I had coming into the season as a, as a first round prospect. He um, improved a little bit as a three point shooter, but didn't make like, you know, the strides that I think people expected, but um, was above 30% from, from three-point range last season. That, that great team was really good. They were really loaded with talent. So, um, yeah, like I, I think Phillips is most likely to stay in the NBA draft, but if, if both of them do come back to school or neither of them come back to school, like it, I don't think that either decision would, would totally surprise me. Yeah, yeah, agreed on both fronts there. Uh, it's so interesting. You know, we talked about Uday transferring out and, and what we think those tea leaves are telling us. For North Carolina, mm. they lose DeMarco Dunn. That says to me that Hubert Davis already had a loaded backcourt, like overflowing too many, but that we're going to get a reclassification from Elliot Cadeau, a top 10 player in the class of 2024, who might reclass into 23 and essentially probably be handed the keys to that offense as a true pass first point guard. So we'll keep our eyes on that as well. Kyle, I want to ask you about the UCLA side of this because they've lost yeah. two bigs in the past 48 hours, essentially with uh, Kenka on Wednesday and then Mac Etienne on Thursday. As we keep thinking tea leaves, what, what, what might that be telling us about what Mick Cronin's got going on there? In Los Angeles. Oh, is is Adam Bona coming back? I don't know. It just it I don't just, I don't think he is, right? No, I don't think so. But it's just like it are those things related? You know, these two guys in two days. Uh, is there something else going on that we might not know about? It's just you know, yeah. you bring up such a good point about reading the tea leaves that when yeah. I see two guys of similar position from the same school leaving within 24 hours of each other it's like so something's going on here that i just don't typically that's not coincidence in our world as we look at these things no that's exactly right that's exactly right i have 247 sports's page pulled up right now and uh one guy who is on the radar and i'm not exactly sure when he was offered is a day mara who's seven foot three 250 pounds um, it looks like UCLA is offered, but again, don't know when that was. It looks like an international prospect. So, right. you know, maybe, maybe this is a guy who's like a potential second option, someone who uh, if they miss in the transfer portal, they go after him. Or even they're maybe targeting him and trying to get some, some, some help out of the transfer portal. I'm not entirely sure. I feel like Bona is probably going to stay in the NBA draft. Um, yeah. So maybe a, a tad misplaced in, in uh, possibly thinking he may come back. I mean, it's, it's, it's always possible. Um, sure. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those situations. Like, UCLA is, like, a pretty solid spot. They're coming off a really good season. Like, um, definitely perks your ears up when, uh, when you've got a ton of, like, depth and, and potential star power, like, leaving – going into the transfer portal. Um, definitely one of those – one of those things makes you, makes you raise your eyes about or eyebrows. A little bit <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I wondered yeah. about like Warren Washington, who was one of the final bigs in, but then he committed to Texas tech earlier on Friday. So I was like, well, it's not him, you know, like it's just, yeah. just something to keep your eye on folks. What What's going on there uh, for the Bruins? Well, we do want to look at, is there anybody who we thought maybe would enter the transfer portal, but didn't and also try to figure out, what has Rick Pitino going to have at his fingertips next season? <laughs> this guy is wild. We'll talk about it here in just a second. 
All right, we are joined today on Locked on College Basketball by our guy Kyle Boone of CBS Sports. Great college basketball writer. Got a busy season coming up as he gets all the NBA draft stuff going. But we are talking today about the transfer portal, which closed on Thursday evening. And so now we're wanting to just recap that a little bit. And so often we're looking at, okay, who's in? Who got in? Who's the unexpected people that came in? But often there's the question of, you know, I based on playing time or situation or whatever, there's people that it seem like obvious candidates to jump in that don't always end up doing so. And so, Kyle, I'm wondering for you, is there anyone who you kind of had your eye on as like, oh, that, that guy's a candidate to jump in the transfer portal that maybe didn't? Mm. Um, let's see, a couple months ago, I would have said Armando Baycott. Just to just to feed your UNC fan base, um, the fact that he's saying isn't surprising though. Um, man, Arthur Kaluma in in the transfer. I know we talked about him, but that makes a lot of sense. Baylor Shireman's coming back. Um, don't know what Trey Alexander is going to do, but I think he has an interesting decision. If he decides to come yeah. back, then then some potential opportunities could be taken away from Kaluma. That would make a lot of sense to, to either transfer or to go and just stay in the NBA draft. Um, man, I can't, I can't think of some other guys. I mean, there's there's some, there's like more than a thousand people in the transfer portal. So like, no, at, at any point in time, I feel like just like more names are piling. Do you have any names that are like sticking out to you? Because like anyone who, enters the transfer border and I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's, it's like, <laughs> I'm, at this point, like we've been in this enough cycles now where it's like, nothing surprises me. It's like, oh, I wouldn't have guessed that, but it's like, all right, sure, you yeah. do your thing. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, just there are depth pieces that you look at oftentimes that I'm like, yeah. oh, he's not going to be starting, so I thought he might move on um, and, and doesn't. Um Nobody initially comes to mind for me either. It's just uh, an interesting thought exercise to explore that. So um, yeah. it's just always. I mean, all the, there's so many like big names that have already like entered the transfer portal this this off season. Like, you know, you just go down the list of like guys who were first like top 25 or so five star recruits last year. I mean, Dan Bradley um, is one of them. Looking back. Arterio Morris is, is another one who was, you know, number 16 last year's class, transferring from Texas to, to Kansas. Um, Julian Phillips, another guy who was a top 15 recruit. Um, I mean, a lot of these guys are going to end up being, you know, like one and done, and it could be first round picks. Uh, Khalil Ware, who, who we mentioned earlier from, from, uh, from Oregon, he is going to Indiana. Um, one name that pops up to me, like, I'm not like speculating. I yeah, have sure. zero inside information, but like Amari Bailey is kind of an interesting one. Um, mm. Five star recruit from from last year's class was uh, was top ten in his class and like kind of limited last season at UCLA just because like that that was a pretty veteran heavy roster. But down the stretch, man, like Amari Bailey is freaking awesome. Like yeah. just an amazing yeah. score, and I think we saw some like real NBA potential with him. Like. I think he's one of the more like interesting stay or go decisions because if he comes back to college, like I, I could easily see him playing his way into potential lottery pick territory. Whereas this in this particular class, like I, I have him as first round pick. Like I think he is a top 30 prospect in 2023 class. Um, but I don't think it's like a consensus from the NBA right now. And I mean, maybe that changes of course, but like, he has to kind of kind of weigh that calculus and figure out does he want to come back to school does he want to stay in the draft um that's an interesting one if he ended up entering the transfer portal it would it would shock me honestly because you yeah. like he'd be the he'd be a stud at ucla but um you know maybe different situation different fit would uh would be really interesting that'd be like a huge name uh probably like one of the most coveted players and Giants from like california so i can't again like just, just kind of like almost wish casting here, just to see some drama. But I can't imagine. 
<laughs> yes, agreed. Well, let's move on to the East Coast and St. John's, Kyle Boone, because we learned that Jordan Dingle, the reigning Ivy League Player of the Year from Penn and last year's second leading scorer in the entire nation, all 363 teams in Division One, and our man Jordan Dingle was the second leading scorer, becomes Rick Pitino's sixth incoming transfer this offseason six transfers out six transfers in zero some game plus they've also recently added notre dame decommit brady dunlap who might be able to provide some shooting from the outside three of these transfers in came from iona with coach patino and then you add national champion naheem aline and glenn taylor from oregon state but kyle here's the question out of these six transfers in plus let's add brady dunlap is Dingle the prize recruit of all of this? Is he the most important piece of all of these guys that so far Patino has brought in? I mean, I think so. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's the case. Like someone who was that productive last season, even at a lower level, even at a place like Penn, that, that often translates. Um, and we'll see if it, it translates to the Big East. Like we'll see. Um, but yeah, like to me, I would probably say Dean was the most impactful. I actually really like Aline from from UConn. Like he showed some real flashes last season. But that, again, another super deep team that had a ton of pieces like Jordan Hawkins. I mean, like there was there was a ton of guys in that backcourt. So it makes sense that he would leave and find a different situation. This this St. John's team is going to be like really interesting next season. Like there, there's a, obviously a lot of new pieces, and I think on its face, you look at kind of okay, they're lo- they're losing six guys and they're adding six guys out of the portal. They have two other you know incoming high school recruits. It's 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 one of those things where you're like okay, well, um, let's see if they gel. Let's see if they figure it out. But like every single year now, every single team is doing this exact same thing. It is just complete juggling you're trying to figure out your roster every single year like i think teams that are able to you know withstand blows from the portal and and keep most rosters intact is going to be like totally unicorn territory that's not going to happen anymore so like marquette um, last year is a great example of that exactly yeah and so rick patino like great coach a guy who seems to always figure things out like he one of the best tacticians best coaches in college basketball history um in this era of college basketball like i'm pretty pumped up for it like i'm i'm pretty high on st john's and, and maybe like you know they finished eighth in the big east and whatever um like what surprised me i guess because it, it's his first season taking over the program but they have a lot of in- interesting talent next season and i think there's some excitement around st john's which is like I can't say I've been too excited about St. John's basketball in a long time, but I, I start to feel some some tingly things right now about it. I, I'll just let you keep working on those tingly things, KB, and uh, you have fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm with you. To me, it comes down to either Dingle or Naheem Aline, who, yeah. when he was at Virginia Tech, let's remember back to that, was averaging essentially double digit scoring there for the Hokies and then didn't have as much of an offensive scoring impact for UConn this year. But again, as you said, it was such a loaded team and he just didn't need to. But when he did score at a high level for the Huskies, they were a very productive team. You know, there I can't even remember what the stat is now off the top of my head, but it was like when he scores eight or more points, they were like 12 and one or something like that last year. And so uh, could be very productive for St. John's. And so I, I think here's the question for us to wrap this thing on. Yes or no, St. John's is an NCAA tournament team in 2024. Mm, man, I wish this is one of those questions. I wish I could go straight to the Ken Palm page and be like, "All right, what is what does Mister Palmer really think about this? Like, where is his rankings? We don't have that yet, so we don't have it yet. Uh, oh gosh, I, I would put. Let's see, let's put an over under on this. I would okay. say the chances of St. John's making the NCAA tournament next season forty percent. Would you take the under or the over? 40%. Uh, at 40%, man, Big East is loaded. Mm-hmm. Again, it is. <laughs> but great go- competition. They're going to have, like, it's yep. it's the Big 12 thing where yep. they're going to yes, have a exactly, ton of exactly. really good opportunities all season. I would take over 40% in part because I mean, of that reason. 
because yeah. I believe in Rick Pitino and because, as you said, it's all about what teams gel the best. I think that's part of why we continue yeah. to see so many more upsets now um, is just yeah. because it's like teams are trying to figure each other out. And I think somebody like Patino, who's still virile in his older age, is going to be able to get that done for the Red Storm. So I would go yeah. over 40%. What about you? Um, yeah, this this is St. John's podcast now. We're taking the over, baby. St. John's <laughs> over 40%. I think they're going to be in the tournament next season. I really like this team. I like what Rick Patino has put together. And they may not be done. Like they are, they are on a roll right now. And I think you add a guy like Jordan Dingle to the mix. Like you've opened up a lot of possibilities. I think for your roster, you've got some momentum. There's already a ton of like you know hype and momentum because I don't know. You're Rick Pitino. You're one of the greatest coaches of all time. But now you're getting buy-in from player from from high school ranks and from the portal. Um, it's it's going to be really interesting. Um, and I'm really high on this, this St. John's team. I'm, I'm excited to watch some St. John's basketball. Yes, excited. and it matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's, I, I, it's just good for college basketball that the Big East is yeah. where it's at and that St. John's is a part of that. It makes yeah. me so happy. Let's go. Kyle Boone, thanks so much for joining us today. Hope things go well at the Combine. Can't wait to catch up with you after that and hear yeah. everything that you're – seeing folks thanks so much for joining us on today's show make sure you go check out all of kyle's great work at cbs you can follow him on twitter at kyle underscore boone b-o-o-n and don't forget that e on the end of that thing please if you would go to apple Podcasts or anywhere else you listen give us a five star review don't forget to subscribe to the show smash the like button we'd love to hear your comments on where you think mckenzie and baco are land and uh tell us how dreadfully wrong we are on our saint john's takes as always apologies to the lawyer family go wildcats and until next week peace